I was asked to speak on platforms and ecosystems, and I have to say that was fairly intimidating because everybody is talking about platforms and ecosystems. What could I possibly say that would be different and helpful uh, relative to everything else that's been discussed? But I'm hoping that by the end of my presentation, I'll have convinced you that there's, we're barely scratching the surface of platforms and ecosystems, and that there's an untapped opportunity waiting to be addressed that could create so much more value for all of us. And so that's my focus for today. I'm going to start by setting some context. And that's, first of all, something that you're going to hear about through the entire three days here, is that we are increasingly moving into an exponential world, being shaped by exponential technologies. And that exponential world has a lot of implications for us. And one of the things that we're hearing with increasing frequency is the notion that all of us as individuals are going to have to commit to lifelong learning. That's the key. Every day for the rest of our lives. I believe there's an even greater imperative for our institutions. And what I'm talking about here is the need for exponential learning. That in an exponential world, if we're not learning faster and faster, we're going to be increasingly marginalized. We have to find ways to learn exponentially. And here I want to just clarify, when I talk about learning, I'm not talking about learning in the form of sharing existing knowledge, going to a class and listening to a teacher. No, the learning I'm talking about is learning in the form of creating new knowledge new knowledge that was never known before, and doing that through action and impact. And the way to measure that learning is not by taking tests and getting test scores, it's by accelerating performance improvement. If we're not accelerating performance improvement, we're not learning exponentially. And that's the key imperative that an exponential world creates. Because in an exponential world, everything we know is becoming obsolete at an accelerating rate. So if we're not learning faster and faster, we are going to be marginalized. And so I think in that context, the question is, what role can ecosystems and platforms play? And I'm going to start here by focusing on ecosystems and start with a definition, at least what I mean by ecosystems, because one of the challenges I see in all this discussion of these topics is the word is used so loosely, it comes to mean anything. <clears throat> what I'm going to focus on is what I call performance ecosystems. And what I mean here is that they're organized to include a large number of independent participants, not a small number, but hundreds, thousands, increasingly even millions of participants. And these participants are being organized to achieve a, sh a shared goal. Now, there are many different forms that ecosystems can play. Based on the research that, um, that we did at the Center for the Edge, we identified 12 very distinct ecosystems different ways of organizing, different ways of delivering results. I'm not going to go into all 12. All, by the way, I'm going to cover a lot of our research. It's all freely available. It's, we don't charge for the research, so you just have to ask and we can share it. But I'm going to focus here on two different categories of ecosystems. What I call static ecosystems and dynamic ecosystems. And what I mean here in static ecosystems, let me start there. Static ecosystems are approached with the mindset of there's a given set of capabilities and resources out there that we need to connect. And we can create value by connecting those static resources and capabilities. But the resources and capabilities aren't changing. They're a given. The whole focus is on how do we connect the participants to access them more efficiently. 
And basically, most of the ecosystems we have today, the performance ecosystems, are these static ecosystems. Classic example would be a market ecosystem, connecting buyers and sellers to buy and sell products and services. The products and services are a given. It's all about connecting the buyers and sellers. And it's about short-term transactions. And I think it's, I want to emphasize that these static ecosystems can create enormous value. I actually wrote a book 10 years ago called The Power of Pull. And one of the key themes in The Power of Pull was the emerging necessity for pull in the form of access. How can we access more and more resources and capabilities to address our needs at the moment? It creates the ability for flexibility. We have much more flexibility if we're participating in an ecosystem where we can connect to those resources and capabilities on demand as we need them. It also creates the opportunity for leverage. In a world of increasing pressure, the ability to connect into an ecosystem where we can choose to just focus on the things that we're really good at and rely on others to provide the other capabilities and resources, huge value. So I don't in any way want to suggest these stato static ecosystems don't matter. They matter hugely. But I think the question is, is there something else? Is there another form of value that can be created through ecosystems? And here I'm going to focus on this other category that I mentioned, dynamic ecosystems. Dynamic ecosystems come at the, the mindset of the organizers of these ecosystems is yes, there's a given set of capabilities and resources out there that we could connect, but the real opportunity is to help the participants to accelerate their performance improvement and evolve those capabilities and resources at an accelerating rate. So it's a dynamic view of those capabilities and resources. And the focus of the ecosystem is how do we organize to create an environment where those capabilities and resources can evolve more rapidly. Fundamentally different mindset, different way of organizing. Now we've done a lot of research on what's required to scale learning in those kinds of ecosystems. And one of the things we came up with was that the fundamental unit of organization in these ecosystems is a small group. It's five to 15 people that come together in work groups, or I prefer to call them cells, where they're working together on a daily basis. They get to know each other very well. They develop deep trust-based relationships with each other. And they're committed to getting more and more impact, to learning faster together. And I think if we're talking about learning in the form of creating new knowledge, those deep trust-based relationships are really important because that kind of learning involves a lot of failure. And I'm gonna be much more willing to fail if I'm in a group that I really trust versus a group that may be out to get me. So coming together in these small work groups, absolutely critical to accelerating learning. And by the way, other research that we've done shows that those small work groups, the more diverse they are, in terms of the participants, in terms of the people and the backgrounds and, and perspectives that they bring. The more diversity, the more creative they are, the faster they learn. But the, the unit is five to 15 people. Here's the challenge. <laughs> That's not scalable. It's five to 15 people. Our research shows that if you get above 15 people, the trust begins to th weaken, to thin. So we, we recommend maximum 15 people in these small work groups. The question is, how do you scale that? Well, that's where the ecosystem can play a huge role because it's by, first of all, helping to organize those small work groups, bringing people together in these small work groups, but then connecting those work groups into a broader network so that it can scale and these cells or work groups can learn from each other very different way of organizing. It's something that we've ended up calling creation spaces. 
And our belief is if you're serious about exponential learning, we need to organize creation spaces to accelerate the learning, starting with cells, but connecting them into broader networks. Now, there aren't a lot of examples of these kind, kind of dynamic ecosystems that I've, I've just been talking about, but there are some. We ended up looking at environments where there's sustained extreme performance improvement and see what we could learn in those environments about accelerating learning. And what we found was creation spaces. And I'll just give you a quick example, one of my favorites. We went out and looked at extreme sports. And one area we looked at was big wave surfing. Now, for those on the outside looking in, big wave surfing is a solo sport. There's only one person on that surfboard, that's it. Well, interesting observation. The big wave surfers, those who are really committed to getting better and better at cha more challenging waves, they're coming together in local surf breaks into small cells, work groups, five to 15 surfers that interact with each other on a daily basis, challenge each other, hold each other accountable, support each other when they fail. And those small cells on the local surf breaks are connected into a vast global ecosystem that's helping all big wave surfers learn faster on how to address challenging waves. So very interesting example of that kind of dynamic ecosystem in play. And I think it highlights another level of pull. I mentioned my book, Power of Pull. We talked about access as one form of pull. There's another level of pull, which I believe is actually the most powerful and important one, which is what I call achieve. It's about pulling out of each of us more and more of our potential so that we can accelerate our learning and performance improvement. That's the form of pull that these dynamic ecosystems are so powerful with. And I'll say that, again, in, in ecosystems, we, we all talk about network effects. The more participants there are in the ecosystem, the value increases exponentially. Well, there's a second level of network effects. Because that first level is just, they're given people and they're coming together and they create more value just by being who they are. What if they were learning faster and accelerating their performance improvement by coming together? That's a whole other level of network effect that kicks in and again, drives exponential learning. So our belief is that's actually a very powerful opportunity and yet very few, uh, certainly business people, but people in general, are really focused on how can we organize these kinds of dynamic ecosystems where everybody learns faster by coming together, learns exponentially. So there's a big opportunity here to shift our focus from the static ecosystems that dominate our daily lives and business activities and focus on building, cultivating, and scaling these dynamic ecosystems that can really drive exponential learning. So that's one, one opportunity at the ecosystem level. Let me shift now to platforms. And again, I'll start with a definition because at least in my experience, when people start talking about platforms, it's all about technology. You know, what are the features and functions of the platform? What technologies are embedded in it? My view is actually, ultimately, platforms are not about technology. They are about two things. One is creating a governance structure that can help govern activities across a large number of participants. And then a set of standards and protocols that can help facilitate interactions among those participants. In essence, ultimately, that's what platforms are about. It's helping to scale interactions across more and more participants by providing a governance structure and by providing those standards and protocols to facilitate the interactions. And yes, technology can help, for sure, 
in terms of scaling those platforms, but the fundamental value in them is the governance structure and the standards and protocols. So with that is context, again, everybody talks about platforms differently. That's my definition of platforms. In the research we've done, we've come up with a, a <clears throat> the, the observation that most of the platforms we have today fall into two types of platforms. There's one that we call aggregation platforms. And the focus of these platforms is aggregating participants to engage in short-term transactions. Again, the classic example is a market platform. Connect buyers and sellers, short-term transactions, that's where the value is. You can think about data aggregation platforms where the goal is to help connect people who have need for certain kinds of data with the data that's most relevant to them. But again, it's short-term transactions to help those participants. There's a second kind of platform, a second type of platform, which are social platforms. And we all know about these, they're in the news all the time. It's about platforms that help us connect with each other and form sustained relationships and get, stay in touch with each other uh, through the platform. But basically, if you think about all the platforms we have today, virtually all of them fit into that first category of aggregation platform or social platforms. Is that all there is? Our belief is there are two other types of platforms that should be addressed, but generally are not. The example, one example is um, mobilization platforms. The focus of these platforms is how can we mobilize more and more participants to achieve a shared outcome? Not a shared goal, but we're, co we're co coming together to create something together. An example of this, early example, but uh, I think interesting to, to look at, is Wikipedia, right? Bringing more and more participants together with the goal of creating an online encyclopedia and contributing to the development of that encyclopedia. If you think about um, some of the open source software uh, efforts, Linux, for example, creating a mobilization platform for Linux developers to come together and help evolve Linux over time. But it's a shared outcome. Everybody's contributing to that outcome. That's one, an, one type of platform pretty rare these days. Second uh, unaddressed type of platform, and uh, my belief is the most important and valuable one, and no surprise, it's what I call learning platforms. What if we created platforms with the explicit objective of helping the participants to learn faster together? What would those learning platforms look like? Now, I will say again, there are not a lot of examples, good examples of these kinds of learning platforms yet. But I think one early example that's kind of an interesting one is uh, a, a small startup back in the mid, late 1990s here in Silicon Valley uh, called Portal Player. The founders of Portal Player looked ahead and saw a huge opportunity around creating mass market digital music devices. But at the time they organized their company, there were so many technology challenges to get to anything that would truly be a mass market device. And to their credit, the founders of this company said, we're not smart enough to figure this all out ourselves. And what they did was they created a platform and invited leading edge technology companies from many different components and parts that were required for this kind of digital music player. And they invited them to help address these significant performance issues that were preventing this from becoming a mass market product. And the method they developed was they said, every six months, we're going to release a new platform with the best technology solutions at that point in time from this platform that we've created. 
and their assurance to those who were not invited to participate in that next release was six months later, we're going to have a new release. And if you get better and, and can be best in class at that point, you'll be included in that uh, platform, in that uh, device. Long story short, in a few years, they dramatically improved the performance of all the technologies required for the digital music player. And when Apple introduced its first iPod, guess what? Portal player was the basic platform within the, within the device. They were the key to making this a mass market product. And I think it was a good example of a learning platform where the key objective from the start was how can we help all these participants to learn faster so that we can get to a device that's truly mass market. So an interesting opportunity in terms of really uh, focusing uh, participants. And there are many elements of, if you're really serious about learning platforms, what would be required to d in the design of these platforms. I mean, one element to build on the ecosystem uh, conversation I, I just talked about is the notion of facilitating, creating shared workspaces where small groups can come together on a sustained basis and have rich interactions with each other. Uh, creating real-time performance feedback loops so all the participants can get real-time performance feedback in terms of how they're doing. Creating trust mechanisms like reputation profiles so I know if I'm dealing with somebody I, I have some sense of whether I can trust them or not. There are many elements that would have to come together for these platforms to really scale and accelerate learning. And our belief again is we're just in the earliest stages of exploring what's required for that. So that's another opportunity, is to shift our focus in terms of platforms from short-term transaction, aggregation platforms, and social platforms to mobilization and learning platforms, where we can bring people together to learn faster together. So in the few minutes remaining, let me just shift to a third opportunity here, and I think it's going to be essential for us in terms of how we more effectively harness these ecosystems and platforms. And it's basically adopting a different approach to strategy. And here, I, I, generalization, I would say most of us in an exponential world are falling back on what I would call reactive strategies. The key in a rapidly changing world is just to sense and respond as quickly as you can to whatever's going on, and that's the successful strategy. <clears throat> Our belief is actually in a time of rapid change, we need to adopt a very different kind of strategy. And it's a, a strategy that many of the most successful tech companies here in Silicon Valley have pursued. And I've come to call it the zoom out, zoom in approach to strategy. Basically, this approach focuses on two different time horizons. One time horizon, 10 to 20 years. And on that horizon, the two questions are, what is our relevant market or industry going to look like 10 to 20 years from now? Second, what kind of organization or business do we need to be 10 to 20 years from now? What's the big opportunity that we could pursue in that exponentially changing market. 10 to 20 years, zoom out. The other horizon, zoom in, 6 to 12 months. And on that horizon, the key questions are, in the next 6 to 12 months, what are the two or three initiatives, no more, two or three that we could pursue in the next 6 to 12 months? And do we have a critical mass of resource against those two or three initiatives? Very powerful approach to strategy, very different from the way most traditional companies pursue strategy. But I want to tie it back to this notion of exponential learning. That zoom out can be very effective in identifying a compelling exponential opportunity, an opportunity to create so much more value than we've ever created before because we're looking at the exponential forces that are now enabling this. And it helps to inspire and motivate people to want to learn faster. That's really exciting. How can we get there? 
And then on the zoom in side, the six to 12 months, it identifies a very specific set of tangible initiatives that we can take in the short term to drive the learning that's gonna be required to get to that opportunity that we've identified. So it's the combination of those two, this notion of an inspiring opportunity and very tangible short-term action and impact that we can learn from. And are we accelerating our impact in the short term versus linear or just level impact? That's the key to driving exponential learning. And in that context, this approach to strategy can be very helpful in identifying, given that opportunity that we've identified, who are the participants that we need to mobilize into our ecosystem to help us learn faster? And what kind of platforms could we create to help those participants learn faster together with us? That's a very different kind of opportunity and really harnesses the potential again of moving to dynamic ecosystems and learning platforms in pursuit of a very significant business opportunity. So I've talked initially about this notion of exponential learning as an imperative, and I, I believe strongly in an exponentially changing world, if we're not learning faster, we're out. Faster and faster, not just faster one time, <laughs> but faster every day. And, but on the other side, it's a significant opportunity. It creates an opportunity, if we can learn exponentially, we could create value that would have been unimaginable a few decades ago in a much shorter period of time with much less resource. That's exciting. That's a big opportunity. And so I think the opportunity, and the other opportunity, by the way, is these platforms that I've talked about, they don't exist yet. So there's an opportunity to create these platforms as a business opportunity. If you can create a learning platform and, and demonstrate to the participants that they're accelerating their performance improvement by being on that platform, how much do you think they would pay to participate? It's a big business opportunity. And ultimately, the opportunity of exponential learning and these platforms that I'm talking about is to fundamentally reshape markets and industries, restructure markets and industries. So rather than focusing on this notion of reactive strategies where you just sense and respond as quickly as you can to whatever's going on, how about the opportunity to fundamentally restructure the markets and industries we're in and do that through exponential learning? That's a big opportunity, and ultimately, the opportunity is to create the future. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.